Hey everyone, Laszlo Montgomery here with another podcast, three in a row, on the early years of something or other. Two episodes ago, we looked at the early years of the silk trade in China, then the early years of Christianity, and now we look at the early history of the relations between China and Russia, the Middle Kingdom's great and culturally rich neighbor to the north. Even though they're next-door neighbors, these two peoples, the Russians and the Chinese, they didn't bump into each other until late in the Ming Dynasty. Yeah, it took that long. Distance, one of ancient mankind's oldest enemies, had always kept these two nations apart. Moscow to Beijing was a lot further of a walk than taking any of the Silk Road, so it's not surprising that it wasn't until the late 16th century that China and Russia only first met. And it was more like high by than a real getting-to-know-you meeting. In the beginning, there were the Rus people, from which we get the name Russia. They were centered around Kiev, mostly, and began to broaden their horizons and began pushing their lands eastward. Our story has to do with this expansion of these Rus lands towards the general direction of China, or Manchuria specifically. The early history of China and Russia, I guess you could say, revolved around two things mostly, the border and trade. I thought I'd first quickly skim over the events in Russian history that brought the Russians to China's doorstep. If you remember... Russia used to be part of the Golden Horde. That was one of the four khanates created after Genghis Khan divided up his empire in the 13th century. What Kublai Khan's Yuan dynasty was to China, I guess you could say that's what the Golden Horde was to Russia and Ukraine and Belarus. Things got off to a start in 1325 when the Grand Duke of Moscow, Ivan I, grandson of Alexander Nevsky, if you know your Russian history or if you've been a regular listener to Mark Schaus's excellent and long-running Russian Rulers History podcast. Now, Ivan I cut a deal with the Khan of the Golden Horde to act as a kind of tax collector for the region. All the Mongols cared about was money and sucking the place as dry as possible. They weren't looking to build any Alexandrias or great centers of culture or learning. So if Ivan I offered to do this thankless job for the Khan's government, they were happy. Win-win. This position as tax collector for the Khan of the Golden Horde allowed Ivan I to amass the kind of wealth that might make a modern-day Russian oligarch blush. And this was used to consolidate his position and start pushing out the borders of the Principality of Moscow. Now, one of Ivan I's well-known tricks was to lend money to aristocratic landowners and make them offer up their lands as collateral. And when they defaulted, he called in the enforcers from the Golden Horde to shake them down, and then Ivan I took possession of their lands. Things really started to pop for Russia in 1478 with Ivan III, known in the history books as Ivan the Great, the father of his country, you could say. Few rulers did more to consolidate the lands of the Rus into a nice-sized Russian state than Ivan III. He was the one who began Russian expansion eastward. He was also the first Tsar. This colonization of the East began with Ivan III blasting his way to one military victory after another, using all the new cannon technologies of the day. After the secret of one of China's four great inventions, gunpowder, was no longer a secret, and after the power of exploding projectiles out of a cylinder reached a certain technological state in the 14th century, that was it as far as walled cities went. And it was under Ivan III that the budding Russian state also shook loose from the control of the Golden Horde. And when he died in 1505, he left Muscovy a lot bigger and stronger than when he found it. The march to the east continued with Ivan III's grandson, Ivan IV, better known around these parts as Ivan the Terrible. His reign lasted 1547 to 1584, which if you overlay it on top of the Chinese timeline, puts it at the time of the 12th and 13th Ming Dynasty emperors. 
Long Ching and Wan Li. This is around the time the Jesuits started showing up in that part of the world. Other than the Ural Mountains, the core Russian lands in the West didn't have any halfway decent geographic barriers to protect them. Therefore, they were keen to build up as vast a buffer as possible and keep potential threats far away from the Russian seat of power in the West. Initially, it was a lot of easy meat for Ivan the Terrible as he continued his eastward expansion. A lot of these tribes and former kingdoms and states that his troops defeated were all in decline and left over from the decaying Golden Horde, or some were still reeling from the time Tamerlane laid waste to their lands during the late 14th, early 15th centuries. Those lands had already been softened up sufficient enough to be conquered and be absorbed. When Ivan the Terrible first became Tsar, Russia was a kingdom. By the time he died, it was on its way to becoming an empire. In order for Ivan the Terrible to achieve these ends, he relied heavily on the family who gave us beef stroganoff. Yeah, these were, you guessed it, the stroganovs. They were a rich family of merchants, and on behalf of their benefactor, Ivan IV, they were the ones who facilitated the push eastward and later financed and greased the wheels for the ultimate conquest of Siberia. They did this partly with the help of the legendary Yermak Timofeyevich, a Cossack who had acquired a reputation for his particular skill set, engaging in battle and running roughshod over his enemies. Yermak Timofeyevich acted as the tip of the Stroganov's spear, doing away with many of the biggest impediments to the ultimate objective of Russian expansion all the way to the Bering Strait. The Cossacks were critical to our story, namely because they were the ones who did all the heavy lifting as far as military action, enforcement, and populating a lot of the newly conquered areas. After a thousand years, we still don't know with any certainty who the Cossacks were. In Russian, they were called Kazakh, like Kazakhstan, but they weren't from Kazakhstan. And like the fortunes of the Russian state, those of the Cossacks also rose as the Golden Horde fell. They redefined the words fiercely independent. No one could tame them. All that could be done was to harness their energy and effectiveness as fighters and later as enforcers after new lands were taken. After Yermak Timofeyevich's defeat of the Khanate of Siberia in 1582, there was no stopping Russia. The Stroganovs, working in conjunction with the Cossacks in their employ, made alliances with all the various Mongol tribes along the way. There were so many. Although the glory days of the Mongols were well in the past, they were not so easy to defeat in battle. East of the Khanate of Siberia, was nothing but tundra and the Siberian steppe. No deserts, no mountains, no natural barriers that might inhibit the expansion plans of the Russians. Only one main thing made it a challenge, the distance. It was one thing to walk a hundred miles. It was a completely different thing to seize and hold that hundred miles you just walked. So it was slow going. The Mongols were always warring against each other and entering into all these alliances of convenience that were rarely long-lasting. The Mongols of the steppe, when they encountered these formidable people from the West who entered their lands, they saw them as useful short-term allies against their tribal enemies. The Mongols figured when they didn't need these Russians anymore, they could be easily discarded. <laughs> How wrong they were. Once there... The Russians had no intention of vacating those Mongol lands. Other than all this real estate they were bringing into their new empire, the main thing that the Stroganovs were after, and by extension the Russian state, was soft gold. Soft gold. That's what drove these Muscovites east from their European lands to face all the hardships of the long nights on the cold Siberian steppe. Soft gold, the furs of martens, beavers, wolves. And once they were deep enough into Siberia, there was arctic fox, lynx, mink, 
sable, ermine, and when they finally made it to the Pacific in 1639, sea otters too. Nothing drove the Russians in the direction of Manchuria like the fur business. That's what built the Russian Empire during the 15th, 16th, and especially in the 17th century. And it pretty much all began with Ivan IV, the Stroganovs, and Yermak Timofeyevich. The policy of colonization of the East continued after Ivan the Terrible. Siberia became like the Wild West during the American 19th century. The government made it attractive for Russian citizens to try their luck in Siberia. It wasn't quite 40 acres and a mule, but people came. You didn't need a whole lot of startup capital to get into the fur trapping biz. Early 1500s, the Russians still didn't know about China. But through Russian interaction with the Mongols came their first understanding of the Middle Kingdom. As they got closer and closer, they learned more and more. The Mongols, of course, knew the Chinese since way back when, so they were the ones who initially schooled the Russians on the wealth of that place, its sophistication, and how vast it was as a trading emporium and as a market for their furs. By the early 17th century, Russia thought they'd take a shot and try to make contact with China and rustle up some trade. They attempted to send a trade mission there in 1608 that went nowhere, and then they tried again in 1617. Mind you, this mission also didn't achieve its objective, but the first Russians did finally make it to China. And these were Ivashko Petlin and Andrushka Mundov in 1618-1619. They didn't get to see the Ming Wanli Emperor, but they made it to Beijing, and there... Ivashko Petlin wrote extensively of his visit and described Beijing, calling it a great city in all kinds of ways. He made observations about all the goings-on there, particularly with regard to trade relations and tribute. Like the Americans did in 1783 out of pure ignorance, the Russians showed up for the first time without any of the requisite tribute gifts and without any understanding of how the whole system worked. So they were sent packing. But they were handed a letter from the authorities in Beijing inviting them to come back another day, but to remember to bring the tribute gifts. <laughs> no one in Russia spoke Chinese yet, so this letter from 1619 took more than a half century before it ultimately got translated in 1675. So late Ming Dynasty, China and Russia had their first up-close look at each other. I'm not sure... The Chinese figured out yet who these people were and where they came from, but that would all change once the Qing Dynasty was founded in 1644. By this time in 1619, the Russian march east had gotten them as far as the Yenisei River, which longitudinally is in the middle of Xinjiang, or about halfway to Vladivostok, a city that in 1619 didn't exist yet. So right about here, our story can at last begin. I wanted to give you some background on how the core Russian lands in the West began to spread out in the direction of China. The fur trade is what mainly drove Slavic colonization of Siberia, along with the demise of the Golden Horde and the internecine goings-on amongst the different tribes of Mongols. When Ivashko Petlin went to Beijing, the Russians and Chinese were still ignorant about each other. But at least they got to meet things would really begin to heat up after the founding of the city of Yakutsk, coldest in the world, established in 1632 on the banks of the Lena River. From this early base in Yakutsk, 1,100 miles north of Harbin, which also didn't exist yet, the Russians first set out to explore around the Amur River region. This river is really the big star of our episode. The Amur or Black Dragon River, the Heilongjiang. Now you know where that province got its name. This 10th longest river in the world is central to our story. To the south of the river was the province of Heilongjiang. To the north of the river is today the Russian Amur Oblast, and Oblast is like a Russian province. North of the Amur, historically, was referred to as Outer Manchuria. Now that area 
back in the 17th century when the Russians started poking their nose around. They had all kinds of people living there, but not many Han Chinese yet. Though you couldn't tell, the place was under the influence of the Manchus. It wasn't this independent region with their own political organization. During the Ming, eh, they tried to bring outer Manchuria into the empire, but for a whole number of reasons, you couldn't say it was politically part of China yet. But it was definitely under their spell. Real, true blue Sino-Russian relations began with the Qing dynasty. The Qing government was run by Manchu people, remember? All the Qing emperors, from Shunzhi to Puyi, were all ethnic Manchus. And because all the early actions between Russia and China happened up in Manchuria, that put a particularly interesting spin on the dynamic happening along the Amur River, Manchu territory. Do you remember during the Cultural Revolution, for seven months, from March to September 1969, along the Usuri River on the Sino-Soviet border, there was this very violent but thankfully short-lived skirmish between troops from both nations. Well, I guess you can trace the genesis of that 1969 border clash back to the time of Vasily Poyarkov's 1643 Russian expedition to explore the Amur region. At first, Poyarkov thought they had found Shangri-La, and he sent glowing reports back to Moscow. This led the government to believe all these forts being built along the way especially Yakutsk, could now be supplied from this new, rich area where the Amur River flowed. Supplying this distant part of Russia had become quite a strain on the treasury, not to mention a logistical challenge, you know, given such great distances. Now it was believed that the Amur River region could replace European Russia as a resupply hub for all the colonization happening in Siberia. The problem was that these reports were overly optimistic, and when they took a closer look, other than the fabulous fishing in the rivers, this wasn't the land of plenty that it was first believed to be. And second of all, once the Russians started showing up around the Amur in bigger numbers, the Manchus were tipped off. And though they didn't jump on this right away, this is where the beginning of the border conflict began. And second of all, once the Russians started showing up around the Amur in bigger numbers, the Manchus were tipped off. And though they didn't jump on this right away, this is where the border conflict began. So while the Russians were sniffing around this land known as Outer Manchuria, the Manchus were busy establishing their new dynasty down in Beijing. And right about then, just as this dynasty is beginning to ramp up, these two peoples are more and more getting wind of each other. And as soon as the Manchus get their Qing dynasty house in order and put out all the brush fires around the country, that's when the sparks start flying. At this time, 1640s, 1650s, China was on a serious roll and bouncing back nicely from the slow, excruciating demise of the Ming dynasty. Militarily, they were top-notch. Don't forget, these Manchus were the descendants of the Jurchens, who tortured the northern Song in the early 12th century. So as rough and tough as the Russians were, they had to tiptoe around them and were careful not to create any trouble. They were the visiting team, and far from home, and resupply lines. Since the fall of the Khanate of Siber, the Russians had enjoyed a relative free ride as far as their march to the Pacific Ocean. Once they got to Manchuria, however, they figured out that the final few hundred miles or so to the Pacific wasn't going to be so easy. But one thing we could say about the Russians, when they set their mind to something, nothing gets in their way. The Poyarkov expedition was followed by a second one led by Irofei Pavlovich Khabarov. He worked for the Stroganovs. This Khabarov expedition in 1650... This is where the Manchus and Russians faced each other for the first time, and blood was spilled, mostly on the Manchu side. They figured these Cossacks were just raiding the border and looking for wealth to plunder and villages and towns to extract tribute from. They had no idea yet that these guys were here to stay and to colonize these traditionally Manchu-controlled lands. In 1650, 
Khabarov had the fort of Albazan constructed along the Amur at its most northerly point. In 1651, they set up what would become the second largest city in those parts, Khabarovsk, right where the Usuri and Amur rivers meet. And they made it known to the inhabitants there, using Cossacks as enforcers, that they had to submit to the Tsar. That's where the problem really started. The local people didn't like these Cossacks at all and ran to their Manchu protectors to let them know what was going on. In March 1652, troops were sent north to deal with this unknown invader from far, far away who was trying to colonize what they thought were Manchu lands. So in the 1650s, now everything was out in the open between these Russians who came from the west and the local Manchus. And so began the whole struggle for this Amur River Valley. All the lands north and south of the river had traditionally been under the control, or at least the influence, of the Manchus. But the Russians knew if their own version of manifest destiny was to happen, and they made it to the Pacific, they had to secure this Amur River. The fur trade, by now, was supplying the Romanov dynasty with about a third of their national income. So you can say it was pretty important that this region be secured. By 1658, the Manchus had gone up and attacked the areas around Albazin and Khabarovsk and pushed the Russians back west along the Amur to the city of Nerchinsk. There the Russians regrouped and tried to figure out a next move. The Manchu Qing government had chased the Russians away from outer Manchuria all the way to Nerchinsk and then declared victory and went home. They didn't go after all these Russian and Cossack homesteaders who had established a present in Okhotsk in 1647, Irkutsk in 1652, Selenginsk in 1666, and now Nerchinsk and Albazen in 1658. When everything along the Amur got very quiet all of a sudden, the overconfident Manchus figured it was mission accomplished, and their level of vigilance along the Amur fell. With the Manchus not paying attention, the Russians came back, again, mostly concentrating at the fort they had built in Albazin, present-day Albazino, the most northerly point of Manchuria, on the Russian side, of course. China today could look back on this moment in history, 1660s, 1670s, as their biggest strategic mistake as far as how they might have prevented this whole matter of Russian control north of the Amur. The Russians perceived this failure on the Manchus' part as a weakness and knew when the time was right, they'd return, which is exactly what they did. The Russians hadn't started direct trade with the Chinese. Since Ivashko Petlin's failed mission, they still hadn't figured out how to get around the whole matter of tribute and kotowing, but they did figure out how to use Central Asian middlemen as their trading proxies. These Central Asians all had rights to trade with China and were familiar with all the BS involved. Russian merchants depended on them for a while until they were able to trade direct with China. That day was coming. If you recall from CHP episodes from days gone by, the Qing Dynasty had about 30 years or so of mopping up to do once they toppled the Ming. This was the primary reason the Manchus took their eye off the ball up in Manchuria, There was the eight-year revolt of the Three Feudatories, 1673 to 1681, pacifying Taiwan finally in 1683, and in the northwest was their biggest challenge of all, the Dzungars. The Dzungar state, or Dzungaria as it was also called, came into being around the same time that the Manchus were doing away with the Ming. Four tribes of Tibetan Buddhist Oirat Mongols all banded together during the 1620s, and then along came their greatest leader, Galdan. And Galdan, who became Khan in 1676, would become a major headache for the Kangxi Emperor and would end up playing a critical role in early Sino-Russian relations. Now, I won't go into details, but at its peak, the Dzungar state stretched from about the western terminus of the Great Wall at Jiayuquan, all the way into Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and north into Siberia. The Dzungar Khanate 
was the largest power in Central Asia. They ended up being the last of the Mongol Khanates. After they were put down for good in 1758, there was nothing left standing. The Mongol Empire, so feared once in Asia and the West, was a mere shell of their former glory. And after Galdan met his end, all that was left of Genghis Khan's mighty empire was the Mongolian homeland. And even that wasn't entirely run by the Mongols. So, enter the Kangxi Emperor. He reigned 1661 to 1722. He became the first Chinese emperor to deal with the Russians. But as I said, he had his hands tied up at first, putting out all these fires down in China's southwest, including Tibet, up in Xinjiang with the Dzungars, and Taiwan, too. If not for most of his resources being tied down, dealing with those pressing matters, probably more forceful and destructive measures would have been taken to push the Russians back west and to destroy that fort at Albazin. Alas, Kangxi let them get away and didn't finish off what he started. No efforts were spared to drive homesteaders from China proper into Manchuria. The government did all they could to flood the zone and get that place populated. The Kangxi emperor didn't want the Russians this close to China up in Manchuria, but what he feared even more was the potential nightmare scenario of a Russian alliance with Galdan in the northwest. That's what kept the Kangxi emperor up at night. He feared this most of all, and was keen to nip that one in the bud. By now it was well known to the Manchus who these Russians were, that they came from far away in the west and they weren't such easy people to control or manipulate. They appeared to be a great power by all accounts, in their side of the world at least, and were not to be taken lightly. Although the Manchu army had overwhelmed the Russians at their stronghold in Albazin in 1683 and again in 1686, it wasn't so much a defeat as a temporary setback. A number of embassies had also been sent from Moscow to China, but for reasons due to misunderstandings, mutual cultural and political ignorance, bad timing, and, well, Russia's refusal to come as a tribute-paying nation, the two sides just couldn't meet for any kind of substantive discussion. The Russians, who had gone back to near Chinst to regroup, were itching to resolve this whole matter of the border. They knew China was rich and powerful and a huge market for their furs. They were hot to get some talks going. But back in those days, things moved slowly. Not like today. In 1688, the Russians, assisted by Galdan, invaded the lands of the Khalkha Mongols. Now, their lands were to the east of the Tsungars. They had, up till then, resisted Russian and Cossack incursions into their big slice of Mongolia. But once this powerful group was neutralized, the Russians had one less tribe standing in their way of the Pacific Ocean. When word made it to Beijing that their allies, the Khalkha Mongols, had gone down in defeat against the combined Galdan Russian forces, Kangxi's nightmare scenario came true. Something had to be done. Alarmed by events going on in Mongolia, Kangxi had decided it was time to finally deal direct with these Russians. By now, he knew getting rid of them wasn't going to be easy. They just had to decide where in Manchuria Russia's world ended and where China's began. The Russian Tsar was also of the same mindset and tried to settle this matter once and for all by arranging a high-level embassy to handle this. Alexievich Golovin was sent in January 1686 as a plenipotentiary to negotiate the border and settle matters regarding trade relations, which was the main reason for the mission. In October 1687, Golovin's entourage arrived on the east shores of Lake Baikal at the city of Selenginsk. The Kangxi emperor agreed to meet there to hold these negotiations. As preparations got underway, Galdan's Tsungar forces were in the area, and there was erratic fighting going on. So for this reason, the whole meeting got postponed. Then, Galdan chased the Russians out of their stronghold in Selenginsk, 
and they retreated to Nerchinsk, located on the Shilka River that flowed out of the Amur. Nerchinsk was safely out of harm's way and under no clear and present danger from Galdan's forces. So it wasn't until July 1689 that both sides had agreed to meet in Nerchinsk and that envoys began to arrive. Galavin represented Tsarist Russia, and a Manchu named Songotu, or Suotu, represented the Qing government. There's a long story about the life and achievements of Songotu, but for now, he was a very trusted advisor to Kangxi, especially when the emperor was in his minority, and he was chosen by the emperor to handle this big job. Interestingly, accompanying Songotu were two Jesuits, You recall from last episode on Christianity's earliest years, at this time, Ricci and the Jesuits who followed him had managed to establish themselves in the capital and had proven themselves most useful to the Qing dynasty and had successfully insinuated themselves into the imperial court. Two of their own accompanied the Manchu delegation. And this meeting at Nerchinsk was between Russia and China only. And though much of the discussion had a direct impact on the local Mongols, they were not invited and had no voice in these discussions. It had been exactly 483 years since Genghis Khan was declared Great Khan of the Mongols. Now his people didn't even have a seat at the table and were shunted aside and expected to go along with whatever the outcome was. The Mongol language was the only language both sides had in common. There were Mongol speakers on both sides. But appearances had to be maintained, so using Mongolian was out of the question. And no one spoke Russian on the Manchu side and vice versa on the Russian side. But both sides did have Latin speakers. And so the Jesuits were positioned to play a key role in the discussions at Nerchinsk. The Russians had a few Latin speakers on their side, and so the discussions began this way. Everything got underway on August 22nd, 1689. Both sides went to great lengths to show this was a meeting between equals. Appearances had to be maintained at all times. Up until this time, Russia had always gotten stymied due to the whole tribute matter. Not anymore. The Jesuits cleverly utilized their position to control the discussion. And while no one was looking, slip in a few points that gave them a bit of what they were after. Songotu claimed that all Mongols stretching as far north and west as Lake Baikal had all previously paid tribute to China and to the Manchus, and therefore that's where China's border should be drawn. Well, the Russians weren't going to fall for that one. Their opening gambit called for the border to be made right on the Amur River. They didn't want to lose Albazin, and certainly not near Chinsk. The Russian negotiating position at this time was comparatively weak compared to the Qing dynasty in 1689. These discussions at near Chinsk were anything except civil and orderly. Both sides gave as good as they got. There were threats made and demands were fought over. No one was agreeing to anything and both sides pulled out all the stops to get the best deal for themselves. Then it was learned that the Jesuits were playing games and trying to slip in a few goodies for themselves. And once this happened, you know, both sides turned on them. Songoto even had to tell the Russians not to agree with anything the Jesuits said that didn't concern the border. That's all they were authorized to discuss. And leading up to and during these negotiations at Nerchinsk, both sides did everything in their power to colonize the Amur region and fill up as many of the empty spaces as possible with their own people. It's as if both sides suddenly realized what was at stake in the Amur River Valley and were scrambling to claim the most advantageous positions. So both sides refused to give in on each other's demands. It finally got to the point where the Manchus, with more of a home field advantage than the Russians, started to beat their shields, so to speak, and finally Golovin, weighing the situation, agreed to give in on the key point of where to draw the border. Now, his clear instructions place trading privileges as the topmost priority. And if they had to give up on territory, so be it. And so the Russians, very reluctantly, agreed to abandon Albazin Fort. 
As a concession, the Manchus threw them a bone and they were allowed to still continue to trade there and engage in commercial activities. There were also valuable salt mines uh, at Argunsk along the Argun River that the Russians were allowed to keep. This was another one of the critical rivers of Manchuria. The Amur, Usuri, Argun, Shilka, Zia. These were the highways of Manchuria and where most all of the action took place in this story. When it was all said and done, the Russians got the main thing they wanted. Direct trade access with the Empire of China. In exchange for this, Golovin was forced to give up Russian claims to the Amur River. And so all the lands north of the river, stretching all the way east to the Pacific Ocean, belonged to China. This included where present-day Khabarovsk and Vladivostok are located. Russia held on to the lands west from Lake Baikal to the Argun River. So after the Treaty of Nerchinsk, the Manchu Qing Empire controlled the Amur River. This meant they were able to regulate Russian access to the river. One other point that was agreed to was the return of fugitives sought out by each country. If either side harbored any Julian Assange's or Edward Snowden's or anyone they wanted back for alleged crimes, the other side had to give them up. China in the past had given safe haven to someone the Russians wanted, and so henceforth they agreed not to do this anymore and would hand over their mutual most wanteds. And everyone on either side of the border who wasn't situated inside Mongolia proper, no matter what, you were now either a subject of China or Russia. The text of the treaty was written in Latin. A stele was erected at the mouth of the Argun River with the text carved in five languages. And pretty much until 1858, this Treaty of Nerchinsk acted as the foundation for Sino-Russian relations. The Jesuits turned out a big winner, too. A few years later, in 1702, the Kangxi Emperor, in recognition of the Jesuits' assistance to the Qing government, issued his Edict of Toleration. But as far as the Kangxi Emperor was concerned, the biggest concession he got out of the Treaty of Nerchinsk was Russia's agreement not to form any alliances with Galdan's Dzungar Khanate. And once the ink was dry on that treaty, Kangxi knew he had Galdan in his gun sights. Then once Galdan found himself marginalized and Russia refused to be of any assistance now, well, that was the beginning of the end of the Dzungar Khanate. The Kangxi emperor went straight for Galdan's throat and ratcheted up the heat put on the Dzungars. One other important point, which showed China sure had come a long way, when these two empires signed this Treaty of Nerchinsk, it was the first time in their history that China signed a treaty with a Western power as equals. This was more than a hundred years before the McCartney mission to Beijing in 1793. He didn't get the equal treatment. So 1689, a landmark year in the annals of Sino-Russian relations. With direct access to China trade in hand, Russian caravans began arriving in the capital, Beijing, the Chinese knew right away the Russians had outsmarted them on this one. They discovered, only too late, that there were way more caravans showing up than expected. And one other thing, it seemed as if these Russian merchants didn't want to leave so soon. And with so many Russians lingering longer than the authorities wanted, they started to think that well, maybe a follow-up treaty might be necessary to dot some of the leftover eyes from the Treaty of Nerchinsk. In 1697, Galdan died, and although his demise didn't immediately bring down the Dzungar Khanate, it dealt them a heavy blow, and they were hardly the threat that they had once been to the Qing Dynasty emperors going back to 1687. Later on, the Qianlong Emperor will finish them off entirely in 1757-1758 and follow up the final defeat of the Dzungar Khanate with a campaign of genocide that will clear Xinjiang of these Tibetan Buddhist Oirat Mongols. Things remained peaceful up in Manchuria for the meanwhile as the 18th century dawned, but both sides were sort of getting the feeling that another sit-down was necessary. 
As I said, the Chinese side had a few gripes, and the Russians weren't satisfied with what they got. One thing they were hoping for was to build one of their Orthodox churches in the capital. And, of course, they were pining for more trade concessions to expand the trade in Russian furs and Chinese tea. If you recall from that history of tea series, the Russian people became as hopelessly addicted to tea as everyone else in Europe. And they were one of the few who still liked their tea packed in brick form. The Tsar had sent an envoy to get things started, but he got stonewalled and nothing came of this first post nerchinsk trade negotiation. By 1725, the year of Peter the Great's death, and three years after the passing of the Kangxi Emperor, both sides made another go at sorting out all these outstanding trade issues and how to regulate the trade caravans, as well as a few things relating to the border. So this all resulted in the 1727 Treaty of Kyakta. This was a town located right on the northern border between Mongolia and Russia. So it was a good thing they met in June and not January. At Kyakta, both sides tied up all these loose ends regarding commercial activities. Russia was allowed to build a residence in Beijing that served as a hostel of sorts for visiting diplomats and as an informal consulate. The other Western powers would have to wait until 1861 before they got the chance to build their consulates in the capital. Russia also got their church, for which they were most happy. One more low-key but terribly important and far-sighted thing both sides agreed to. Well, they had had enough of these linguistic inconveniences and being ignorant of each other's language. So they agreed to carry out these student exchanges where Chinese learned Russian and vice versa. And this would start bearing diplomatic fruit in the years that followed. And like the Treaty of Nerchinsk, this Treaty of Kyakta saw Imperial Russia and the Qing Empire meeting as equals. In fact, not long afterwards, China sent its first embassy to Russia, the first ever to a Western power. So after the Dzungar Khanate came to an end, all of Xinjiang and Mongolia, too, was added to the map of the Qing Empire. And it won't be too long in the future when Russians will start pushing south into Kazakhstan. This will create a whole new, long-lasting and irritating point of contention between China and Russia on the Xinjiang border. As we inch closer to the 19th century, the late years of Qianlong, we know what's in store for China. They are going to suffer one of the worst bad luck streaks of any nation in recent history. All kinds of changes were happening in Europe, and the Industrial Revolution that began around the mid-18th century had already transformed things enough in the West, including Russia, where the pump got nice and primed for what was about to go down in China in the mid-1800s. Already by the 1830s, Russia began to catch a whiff of what everyone else saw. China was ripe and ready to be taken down. The West seemed to be rushing forward, riding on the wings of all these new discoveries in science and the technologies they yielded. And in China, time was standing still. As brilliant as Russia's scientists, engineers, and industrialists were, they just couldn't keep up with their rivals in England, France, Germany, and later Japan. Size mattered, but not so much in Russia's case. They knew if they were going to stay in the game and sit at the adults' table, they too had to join in the fray. And watching China get sliced and diced during the 1840s gave Russia the opportunity it was hoping for. Besides everything Russia was observing between the Western imperialist powers and China, they were also starting to freak out at British incursions into Central Asia. It was all starting to happen now. The British were intent on building the largest possible buffer between their crown jewel in India and the Russians to the north. The sentiment in Britain was that the Himalayas were just not tall enough to keep the Russians out. They had to keep the Russians at bay and as far to the north in Central Asia as possible. Then the Russians really got spooked when they saw the outcome of the First Opium War and the subsequent Treaty of Nanjing. Russia was much more familiar with Britain than the Chinese were, so it was quite a shock to their system to see 
how easily this smaller of the two nations was able to project power and subdue the other. So Russia knew China was now back on its heels in a big way. And there's no better time to gain an advantage over someone than to wait till they're down. Now was going to be the perfect time to drag the emperor back to the negotiating table to discuss the ongoing laundry list of border and trade issues. This is where Nikolai Nikolaevich Moravyov enters the picture. He was serving at the pleasure of Tsar Nicholas I out in eastern Siberia. The Russian Tsar assigned Moravyov in 1854 to go to China and to vigorously negotiate for border concessions. The Russian government never liked that. Back in 1689, they had to give up on the Amur River and the lands immediately north of there. And besides, while China was distracted by all these domestic and diplomatic challenges, Russia had been aggressively colonizing the lower reaches of the Amur and once again trying to flood the zone with colonists to make later annexation a fait accompli. Moravyov was determined to scrap part of the terms of the Nerchinsk Treaty and not only redraw the Sino-Russian border at the Amur River, he wanted to have access to the Pacific Ocean. He was going to make the Russian Empire a Pacific naval power or he'd die trying. Sort of like 50 Cent. He saw the land grabs and demands made by the British and the French. Russia had a legitimate fear that one or even both of these two colonial powers, sooner or later, would try to move in on their world by possibly occupying Sakhalin or Kamchatka. Moravyov was keen to preempt any attempts on making this a reality. Well, good news for Moravyov, his timing was impeccable. Not only was China still shell-shocked by the newly energized and militarily equipped Western powers, he saw that China was racked with internal rebellions. Starting in December 1850, the largest and bloodiest rebellion in history began when Hong Xiuquan started his uprising in Jintian, Guangxi province, and launched the Taiping Rebellion. By 1858, Chinese negotiators arrived in the city of Aigun. This is at present-day Heihe in Heilongjiang province, right where the Amur and Zia rivers converge. Back then, Heihe was known as Aihun, or as it's written in English, Aigun representing the Manchu Qing dynasty in these negotiations with Moravyov was none other than Yishan. Some of you may recall he was the one who replaced Qi Shan as chief negotiator with the foreign imperialists. From past episodes, we knew Qi Shan was the one who replaced Lin Zixu after Lin burned all the British opium at Human in Guangdong and all hell broke loose. Qi Shan had been sent down to Guangzhou to deal with the British and ended up signing the Convention of Chenbi, which got him fired. Well, Yi Shan didn't have any better luck than his predecessor, and he will later be blamed for his failures to deal effectively, or at all, with the British in Guangzhou, you know, being forced to ink his name to the Treaty of Guangzhou. Now, way up in Manchuria, Yi Shan had another lost cause on his hands, and he wasn't going to come out on the winning side of this most unequal of treaties. Moravyov knew Yishan's negotiating position was weak. He knew the French and British were turning the thumbscrews on China and making things unbearable with their demands. So with the Qing government on its back in the coronary care unit, and as soon as Moravyov had 10,000 Russian troops in place in the Amur region... He felt he had China right where he wanted them. He offered Russian assistance to China in dealing with these heavy-handed Europeans. Moravyov was seeming to help take some pressure off China. But as a quid pro quo, Moravyov demanded China agree to the redrawing of the Sino-Russian border at the Amur and Usuri rivers. Because the Chinese had their hands tied dealing with other emergencies, they didn't know that, while they weren't looking, Russia had built up this nice military presence along the Amur, ready to use it if necessary. And when it appeared obvious that China was going down for the count in the Second Opium War, that's when Moravyov went in for the kill. In May 1858, Yishan had no choice but to ink his name to the Treaty of Icon, 
This was separate from the treaties of Tianjin that would be signed the following month. Not only did Russia get their border along the Amur River, this is the border that exists in our time, but thanks to yet another of the 21 unequal treaties forced on China, this one after the Second Opium War, called the Convention of Peking, 1860, Russia also got the lands they coveted since way back when that stretched east from Manchuria to the Pacific Ocean. And two years later, on this newly gained territory, yanked away from China after the Convention of Peking, the Russians founded the city of Vladivostok, today home to 600,000 people and home to Russia's Pacific Fleet. Friedrich Engels supposedly said to Karl Marx about this land grab that Russia should be complimented for, quote, despoiling China of a country as large as France and Germany combined, end quote. 180,000 square miles of land. That's California and then some, including a 1,000 miles of coastline. Can you imagine if the United States was down on its luck and our friendly neighbor to the north suddenly decided to take advantage of us? Man, what the Russians did to China was like if Canada annexed our entire eastern seaboard from St. John in New Brunswick all the way down to Virginia Beach, Virginia practically on the border with North Carolina. And for his troubles, Nikolai Moravyov was given the honorary title of Count Amersky and is known in the history books as Nikolai Moravyov Amersky. Part of the Convention of Peking called for China and Russia to sort things out in Xinjiang with respect to the northwest border. So in October 1864, China had to sign another unequal one. Yeah, the Treaty of Tarbagatai. That settled matters in Xinjiang with respect to the border. After signing that treaty, China took a net loss of 350,000 square miles. That's 9.75 trillion square feet, if you want to look at it that way. 224 million acres. This was truly one of the greatest land grabs of all time. By the time the Qing Empire signed this 1864 treaty, they had been stripped by Russia of about a million square kilometers of land in Xinjiang and Manchuria. That's the size of all the land in the continental United States from the Mississippi River to the eastern seaboard, including Rhode Island and the Florida Keys. Russia Got to stick it to China a few more times before the 19th century came to a close. In February 1881 came the Treaty of St. Petersburg. If you remember from that William Mesny Part 2 episode, 178, the Russians had rushed in and made themselves at home in Yili on the northwest border of Xinjiang. And they were keen to keep Yakub Beg and his Muslim Dungan Revolt of 1862-1877 on the Chinese side of the border and away from Russia. The Dungan Revolt, I've mentioned before, was another major upheaval going on right as the Taiping Rebellion was starting to wind down. The Dungans were a Turkic-speaking Muslim people, as I said, led by Yakub Beg. And he was finally put away by the immortal Zhou Zongtang, General Zhou, as he's known in many a Chinese restaurant here in the beautiful country. So the Treaty of St. Petersburg, the Russians returned the lands to China in the Ili Valley that they had been squatting on, but they kept the mineral rights underneath. Thank you very much. Oh, and they took their sweet time vacating the Ili Valley too, but a couple of years after the treaty. And China just stood there old, toothless, and powerless to do anything about it. That Russia was mocking them in the Northwest was the least of China's problems. You'd think that was humiliating enough, but as an added kick in the ass, the Chinese government had to fork over 9 million rubles to pay for various costs and compensation to Russian subjects affected by the treaty. And Russia also got somewhat of a free hand. All around Xinjiang were allowed to build various consulates in all the areas where Sino-Russian trade and commerce was happening. It was always about trade. Boy, imagine trying to get away with that today. Do you think Xi Jinping would mind? The 1881 Treaty of St. Petersburg was followed up 15 years later by the secret Lee-Labanov Treaty. 
Alexei Labanov Rostovsky, representing Russia, signed this deal in secret with Li Hongzhang. Remember him? He got to sign more than his share of unequal treaties. Labanov died shortly after signing this in Moscow on June 3, 1896. He was foreign minister at the time. This was a year after the 1895 Treaty of Shimonoseki that ended the Sino-Japanese War. And this is where Japan hits the big time and gets to line up with the Western imperialist powers for their fair share of China. In 1895, Japan had helped themselves to all kinds of nice things. Manchuria, Taiwan, a huge war indemnity. (laughs) Oh, man, China was already calling the 1840s and 50s the good old days compared to now. I'm not sure if you remember... Regarding the Treaty of Shimonoseki, Japan went and latched onto the whole Liaodong Peninsula for themselves. Russia, in 1895, teamed up with France and Germany to lobby the Japanese to give that back to China, seeing how good they had made out with everything else. So by all appearances, Russia went to bat for China. But not really. They were, they were helping themselves out because, as we'll see in a minute, they ended up being the beneficiaries of... Japan's exodus from the Liaodong Peninsula and took it for themselves. At the time of the signing of this treaty, Li Hongzhang was in Moscow for the coronation of the ill-fated Tsar Nicholas II. Li was also there holding discussions with Russian representatives to bury the hatchet about past disagreements and join together to combat all this potential Japanese aggression that was going on in China's northeast. This was a situation that both China and Russia shared a concern. There were also loan negotiations whereby Russia agreed to help finance some of China's crushing debt. By now, the Qing government was up to their eyeballs in war indemnities. China also allowed the Russian navy to call at Chinese ports, and the centerpiece of the deal, perhaps, involved the Trans-Siberian Railway, which was then under construction. An agreement was reached that allowed for a shortcut to be built that allowed the Trans-Siberian to go through Heilongjiang and Jilin provinces in order to avoid having to go north of the Amur River to lay those tracks. Now they got to cut right through Manchuria, and then the railway terminated in Vladivostok. And if Russia was going to build their railway, they needed their people to police it and protect it. So China had to look the other way as Russian troops came pouring into China to control the railway, building the city of Harbin in the process. Now, this wasn't quite like handing Manchuria over to the Russians, but public sentiment was that with friends like these, who needs Western imperialists? What Russia was carrying out in China's northeast was known as railroad imperialism. So starting in 1896 with this Lee-Labanov Treaty, Russia got to make themselves at home in Manchuria, south of the Amur. They were led in ostensibly to aid China against a now very aggressive Japan. But in reality, the Russians just used this new dynamic to expand their power and influence in the region. Oh, and by the way, Li Hongzhang made out pretty good in this secret unequal treaty. He got a nice backhander of three million rubles for his efforts. Li Hongzhang, the closer. This deal also included the Liu Da Zu Di Tiao Yue. That's what made it official, as far as Russia ending up in Liaoning province. This convention for the lease of the Liaodong Peninsula put the Russians in the driver's seat down in Port Arthur, or Liu Shun, basically Dalian. The Trans-Siberian Railway was extended down to this line that had been built by Russia inside China for their own convenience, and it terminated at Port Arthur. This line was called the Chinese Eastern Railway. Elsewhere, where the Bohai and Yellow Seas came together, Germany was getting cozy down in Qingdao, and the British occupied Weihai Wei. So Russia had to get some muscle in the region, or else they'd find themselves muscled out. This is where the mad rush to establish spheres of influence in China began. China was being carved up like a turkey, and all the attempts at domestic reforms that had been going on the past few decades, it had only led them to this. The great minds in the country were still 
debating about the best course to take to modernize the country. It was quite disheartening to Chinese patriots to see how big of a head start these imperialist powers had over them. As it turned out, things weren't going to get any better for a long time. But at least all the movers and shakers who would take to the stage in the Chinese Civil War and the founding of the PRC, they're all being born about this time. So thanks to these wheelings and dealings behind closed doors, the city of Dalian came under Russian control. But not for long. After Japan trounced Russia in 1905 in the Russo-Japanese War, that was the end of Russian domination in the Liaodong Peninsula. The late 1890s were the most humiliating years of China's century of humiliation. That something like the boxers erupted onto the scene at the turn of the century it isn't surprising when you take everything into consideration. But we're going to leave the boxers for another day. So we're going to leave the interesting early history of Sino-Russian relations right here for a bit. The Romanovs are going to be overthrown not long after, and then starts the whole story of Sino-Soviet relations. And if you thought this story was good, wait till we get into that one. By the way, this whole matter of the Sino-Russian border wasn't finally worked out until 1992. And then the last few crumbs of contention, whatever one side or the other was still squawking about, they were dealt with in 2004. I'll tell you, during the Cultural Revolution, the fever pitch years, long after the Sino-Soviet split, the leftists in China launched a full-scale dredging operation to dig up the Treaty of Aigun and the Convention of Beijing and rub both of those unequal treaties in the face of the USSR. They didn't demand the lands be given back, but the bum deal China got was... Even in the 1960s, a century later, still a raw wound that never completely healed. The prevailing attitude in China at the time felt that Khrushchev should at least admit that what Imperial Russia had done was not fair. Alas, cooler heads did not prevail, and then a few years later in 1969 came the shootout on the Usuri River around Tomansky Island the Sino-Soviet version of our American Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962, Mao himself had said, quote, There are too many places occupied by the Soviet Union. The Russians took everything they could. Some people have declared that the Xinjiang area and the territories north of the Amur River must be included in the Soviet Union. About a hundred years ago, the area to the east of Lake Baikal became Russian territory, and since then, Vladivostok, Khabarovsk, Kamchatka, and other areas have become Soviet territory. We have not yet presented our account for this list. End quote. The way Khrushchev saw the matter was a little different. He had said of Mao's angry words about the border, quote, As far as we were concerned, we weren't responsible for what our Tsars had done. But the lands gained from those Tsarist treaties were now Soviet territory. We weren't the only socialist country which had to administer and defend the territory inherited from a pre-revolutionary regime. We were afraid that if we started remapping our frontiers according to historical considerations, the situation would get out of hand and lead to conflict. Besides, a true communist and internationalist wouldn't assign any particular importance to the question of borders, especially borders between fellow socialist states, end quote. I guess the early history of Russia-China relations is a history of defining these borders. First, Russia began packing on the territory, starting with Ivan III and Fourth. They toppled any Mongol tribes in their way. And then the day came when they got as far as western Manchuria and ran into you-know-who. When China was strong, from Xunzhou to mid Qianlong, Russia had to accept Chinese primacy in the lands they so coveted. But once they saw China down on Payne Street, they feasted along with everyone else lined up at that buffet table. And though I didn't discuss it in this episode. Russia also, between 1911 and 1924, peeled away Outer Mongolia from China's traditional sphere of influence. 
If you look at any of the old maps of China during the Qing and early Republican period, you'll see Mongolia is included as part of the political map of China. Well, Russia didn't annex Mongolia, but they did turn it into a Russian satellite. Let's close the book right here and call it a day. We're going to save the topic of Sino-Soviet relations for another day. In this episode, I only want to look at the early days when these two great powers first met and also examine the forces that shaped the history. This is Laszlo Montgomery, and you could guess where I'm signing off from. I'll give you a hint. We got five Chinatowns and growing. That's right, Los Angeles, Cali. Come on out and visit us and bring your sunglasses. Oh yeah, did I mention you could also listen to episodes from the China History Podcast and Chinese Sayings Podcast when you fly Cathay Pacific. Don't worry if you forgot to pack your headphones. Take the cheap ones in that seat back pocket, plug into the armrest, and snooze away to your heart's content listening to your humble narrator pontificate about the history of tea, Chinese history, and learn a few chung yu while you're at it. Cathay Pacific Airways, mes amis, for a life well-traveled. Take care, everyone, and I hope to see you again one fine day for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.